Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak here for the invitation with organizers for this wonderful workshop. Um, I'm going to talk about projection theorems and ethics. I know this topic is a little away from uh, the topics in this uh, workshop, so please feel free to um, stop and ask any questions. So, um, suppose that uh, V is a uh, k dimensional subspace in Rn. So, we define uh, Tv as the orthogonal projection of Rn to V. Um, so, the first that we are interested in is. Suppose we have a subset of R and E, and lambda is a subset of the Grassmannian, uh, the like the set, a set of k-dimensional subspaces of R N, and they are both compact. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the um, supremum of the Hausdorff dimension um, of the orthogonal projection image of E for V and uh, set of, uh, a set of K dimensions. So we are interested in the uh, So this is the question that we are interested in um, that what projection theorems. Studies, and um, well, the answer is uh, so. The, the answer depends on uh, e and uh, lambda. Uh, for example, I can think of uh, uh, one enemy example is uh, you take. Okay, maybe I should just say okay, it's a simple example when k is one and then so b is like a line, so it's say spanned by uh, theta in a unit vector theta. Then we can also say p sub theta uh, n to r defined by. So x maps to the dot product of x and the So for most of the talk, we're only interested in this dot product, this orthogonal projection. And for example, one enemy example for this question, when k equals to one, we can take. Um, Suppose that this uh, lambda is this great circle. And then we take our E to be uh, a subset of the line of a line uh, L that's uh, normal to this great, uh, the, the hyperplane that contains this great circle. And in this picture, so this is our E. In this picture, we know that for any data, P theta of B is just uh, because they are orthogonal. And so this is an anime example that if we want a good estimate of such group, <coughs> we want to avoid it. Uh, but before that, um, there is the classical theorem of um, Maestro. And also uh, by Martina. So, Master proved a uh, low dimensional version of Martina. Say so that. So, their theorem is about say uh, this lambda is the whole set of uh, the grass manual that for almost uh, every V for almost every K. Dimensional subspace. Uh, and the dimension, the 
projection image equals to the minimum of the positive dimension of E and K. So roughly speaking, from almost all the uh, projection, we keep the dimension or uh, it reaches the maximum dimension possible. Now, um, because here we have access to almost every case uh, uh, subspace. So we can uh, here is like in this case we have access to almost uh, every directions. So um, so this is not almost every, and that's one way to uh, ex to get rid of uh, this enemy example. Uh, but in in some cases we don't have access to almost every um, case subspace. So what can we do? So there is this, for example, one question that I learned that may, might appear in dynamics is we are interested in uh, this and projections. Sometimes you, you divide by t, but uh, essentially it's this map. Um, so one that is interested in knowing, like uh, under this map, how does the, what's the dimension of the projection image by t of e? Okay, so this question was also uh, asked by. Um, So this was a uh, last I think in 2013, they, they ask um, a, a question of this type. So suppose that um, the set of directions now is, it's like the direction is T is zero. So in this picture, this row looks like, uh, if we uh, divide by the norm of the vector, it will look like this one. That's like um, lambda. When our new lambda is here, it's, it's no longer uh, a great circle. So this enemy will not exist. And this is a, like a quantitative way of um, saying that it's not a great circle. Um, So for, for most of this talk, we'll be talking about this projections, um, this projection. Um, are there any questions so far? Uh, yeah, well, what was the result of my class there or opponent? They, so they asked the question. Oh, they asked the question. Okay. And then I, I will say what, they, they also show some things that I, I will say what's the result. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, this is the result. I, I write it beforehand because there are many names, just in case, so that I don't forget. Also, this is not a complete list of names. So this is the result. I uh, say let's come on um, from zero to one to Rn be a non-degenerate curve, um, meaning that the determinant of gamma prime and gamma n to the n is non-zero. Uh, let E be a compact subset of Rn. Then for almost every T in 0, 1, and this V, K, T means the, uh, like the span of the first K derivative, like the, some sort of K tangent plane of this, um, of this non-degenerate curve at point T. The conclusion is that the house of dimension of the projection image on this uh, k-dimensional subspace uh, equals to the minimum of the dimension house of dimension e and k. So we obtain uh, like a Maxwell type theorem uh, with only the directions on, on this non-degenerate. 
instead of the whole of first manager. Yeah, that's the that's the result. And so uh, when d equals to three and k equals to one, this so uh, can mark it an uh, opponent of the theory. They proved um, for uh, a, a special curve that's that's like the lambda, the red lambda over there. A proof for this curve and. Um, Later by uh, many Yang and Zhao, they prove for general non-degenerate curve. Then uh, also by Gan, uh, Gust and Marda, they also prove for a general non-degenerate curve by using different methods. So I should say that uh, this group, uh, this group, they use <coughs> uh, they they use this uh, the so the method developed uh, by uh, Wolf and Schwab um, uh, curve cut here. So it means that uh, intersection of uh, us, uh, C2 curves in R2, that's the neighborhood of C2 curves. But they use this method. Um, and this group, and so later uh, when d equals to three, k equals to two, and there is another group that, that's like a, this. This, this is, uh, so the, all the rest uses um, a Fourier analysis method that we are going to discuss next. So, um, uh, so with Gan and Guo, we proved the general cases for all d and k, k is more or equal than d. So this, so this is the thing that we are going to talk about. Um, so you said they proved for that to red curve? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think <coughs> the, the set is uh, one, cosine theta, sine of S. So this is this. Um, but does that despite that the determinant being on zero condition? Uh, so yes, that's a good question. So it is so this is so here we are when k equals to one, this is kind of uh, gamma prime and and the, the direction is gamma prime. And this curve, what I mean is like this gamma prime. But there is one derivative. But you need the determinant being on zero there. Three derivatives, or um, so I think in reality, if um, so, this corresponds to a curve whose gamma prime theta is that, uh, and then you 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 take the double prime and triple prime, the, the derivative will be the prime. Thank you. So I yeah. So we can also formulate as gamma. And gamma to the n minus one, and now here you want to map it to say as n minus one. It's equal. Okay. Um, so for the rest of the talk, we'll be focus on k equals to one, uh, and then also we will discuss uh, general method that's um, that can. Probably uh, we'll discuss this connection to uh, free analysis and decoupling theory, uh, and also say in the end say something about where this method works well and when it doesn't. So uh, before that, I want to introduce a notion, uh, say a notion of delta uh, set. Say delta positive is so this this delta t set is um, approximation of a t-dimensional set. Well, so this delta is the scale, and it, we should think that think that is very close to zero. So a delta t set e is a union of delta balls. Satisfying okay. 
this notation um, say, so we call this delta covering number means minimum number of delta balls needed to cover it. But so this sometimes we call it a ball condition, means that the, the set, the union of delta balls are not concentrated on any, in any ball. Um, so, could the exponent of RBT not delta? Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yes. Uh, so th this this R to the T means uh, like how non concentrated it is. So the T is the dimension. When the dimension is smaller, then it should be sparse. So one thing, um, one. One basic consequence of this definition is like from a delta, if E is a delta T set, then the delta covering number of E is greater than uh, delta to the minus T because we can take R to be delta and then uh, T delta to be one uh, delta ball of E. So the left hand side is one. And then when R is delta, so we move this to the left hand side, it shows that the delta covering number E is at least delta to the minus t, but it might be uh, a lot larger. Another quick question. Can you give an example of saying it wouldn't have this property? Um, or is it? Uh, so you mean it wouldn't have this property for any t? So if t. Or maybe for a fixed t. <coughs> Okay, sure. Yes. So if you have, say, if you if your set E is a line, then you if you take your T equals to two, then E is not a delta two set. Okay. That's a good question. So I I, I think this should be viewed as a definition for set of dimension at least T at scale delta, not exactly T. Okay. Then, um, so when we study this, um, okay. So now the setting is suppose delta t set. Then lambda. Since we are considering only k equals to one, uh, delta s So here we can uh, we want to assume that e is a uh, t is less than uh, and then for each Theta lambda is so the key theta will map. Let's say this direction is theta. Then we have a set of delta balls that's not E. And so this P theta will map E to uh, this line. And we consider those fibers. So each fiber will be like. Delta neighborhood because everything is at scale delta. A delta neighborhood of uh, of uh, n minus one plane of, of, a, of a hyperplane. So here, let me just say that we can assume e to be in the unit ball to make things. And the p theta is the map. And then. Um, so let t theta be a set of one times one oops, times down slabs. So we call them slab t theta. That's 
normal orthogonal to theta direction because it's a bipolar. And so, in particular, the, the slabs in the collection T theta is uh, they are parallel because it covers, was union covers. So intuitively, if the projection image is small, then we can find a set, a small set of slabs that covers E. And then, but slabs. So the method is we're going to study the Incidences between this T and E, and conclude that um, for most of the theta, the, this, the set of slabs that covers E cannot be too small. And this will give will proof a uh, lower bound uh, the projection image. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I just forgot that I forgot to mention applications. Uh, okay, sorry, there, there, there are two applications about this theorem that I know so far. One is um, one is in dynamics. That's uh, the work of. And this just Mohammadi and uh, one who is not me but sitting here, and they prove that uh, uh, they, they 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 prove some uh, effective equidistribution result uh, using uh, one of the tools is to uh, use this result about uh, restricted projections from. R three to one R uh, to one R. Um, so, from my understanding of talking to people in dynamics, is that which is very limited is that uh, some. So we don't like when the orbits are uh, equally distributed on some <coughs> low dimensional thing, and this low dimensional thing will maybe I should make it red. So this low dimensional thing will somehow lift to that red lambda. And, and, and if it's equidistributed on the whole thing, then it's, it's kind of like we have access to every theta on, on, the, uh, on the sphere. That's why, that's my understanding. I'm not sure that that's correct. So that's why um, such kind of projection theorems uh, can be useful. And the other application is like some special cases of uh, a uh, problem. Um, I, I will not say too much about that. Um, okay. I hope that gives the name applications and then I will continue to the proof. Sorry, can you say in the application to Kakaya, uh, is it cases where you prove Kakaya under some extra assumption? Yes, so it's there are special cases. So can you just say a word since it does sound very interesting? Um, yes, so, um, so the one, one case is um, like say the so a Kakea set is a set contains a line, a unit line segment in every direction. So if we impose the condition that a lines that are parametrized by, um, in the parameter space is parametrized by points in S, L, 2, Z. Um, and then you, you can say that those Kakea set has four dimensions. And this was the result by a cluster and opponent. Also, uh, by uh, cats uh, and so, well, they use uh, this uh, 
uh, wolf struck a certain Kakea method, and they also managed to reprove this result. Uh, so, so this is for uh, some, the so-called SL2 Kakea. Um, Another special case is about this is in three dimensions. Yes, so in three dimensions. Another special case is about a sticky cacao set. So when the when the lines in the cacao set are, are as close by as possible, um, that like sets in near uh, lines in nearby directions stay close, and it's by uh, this joint work itself, we show that. Um, those sticky cacao set also have a uh, host of dimension three in, in R3. So one, the last step uses, uh, uses uh, one can use the, uh, this, this result or, uh, or, or the <coughs> projection from R3 to R. So that was the two special cases that I had in mind. Thanks. Okay, thank you for the question. So I will talk about the proof and how it's related to decoupling. Um, so, so we have a collection of slabs. So the picture is in each direction, we have those parallel slabs and then we have some other directions. And we also have a collection of points T, uh, E. So, <coughs> and we are interested in studying the set of incidences of the, the pairs X. So X now is a delta ball in E, and T is a delta slab in T. Such that X intersect. So, if we manage to show that this incidence has some, so if we manage to show that the, the, the number, the number of slabs is large, then we can show a low bound about the set of project, the dimension of projections. So we have. We are going to estimate this incidence uh, by Fourier analysis. So let um, for each slab t, let uh, phi t be a smooth bump function as like the characteristic function of t. But we make it smooth because we are going to take the Fourier transform. And then let f be sum over phi t. And when we do integration, uh, integrate f on e, this is like, it's related to uh, 
incidences between E and T. So maybe up to some uh, scaling factor, but these two are almost the same. Um, also, um, we have we have a low amount as like the volume of E. So that's the delta cover number times delta again, and then uh, delta to the minus one. This means that uh, because it's lambda now. Uh, I thought. Sorry, the data cover number of except lambda. And in our in the case that we are interested in, the, the uh, directions are supported on curve. This is delta to the minus one. So we have a long <coughs> part. And um, so I said that we are going to uh, study the first uh, use for analysis. So look at the first transform of IT. So when T is in the corruption T theta, means that this is a slab that's normal to direction phase. And now Um, after some calculation, this is approximately the same uh, if we uh, ignore the, the tail, approximately the same as a constant, that's the volume of t times the characteristic function of, I would say, uh, delta, uh, theta, theta, which is. Um, The uh, two uh, has radius one and length delta to the minus one, pointing in direction uh, beta. This is uh, so. Uh, in this top one, can just think that the Fourier transform by t is like this function. And, and then, uh, so when we think of the free transform of F, it will be um, supposed, it will be the union also centered at the origin. It will be the, the union of uh, those groups. Um, and we know we, we can see that the, was the union of those tubes they intersect a lot near the origin, but they are like from for this different directions they are more disjoint when they are far apart. So we are to, we are going to do a, a decomposition of high low frequency. Uh, we find we take a small ball of radius that's slightly smaller than the the length of each beta delta. So that's Delta to the minus one plus epsilon, where epsilon is positive arbitrary small. And the inside we call it a low frequency part. And we only. So the low frequency part is defined as a first transform of F. And we record it this that. Um, in the ball of radius delta to the minus one plus epsilon centered at the origin times a small spam function at the inverse free transform and the high frequency part is like what the more you think that this is a function that's on the complement of the uh, so for, for the low frequency part, what it happens is when 
when t is less than one. Uh, it's not too difficult to see that the low frequency path never dominates. So, uh, so at the point E, uh, this F L can never be bigger than F. Uh, the, the reason I would, I would illustrate just by picture is that uh, what happens if we um, make, so we take the transform and then we, um, we, we do a frequency cutoff, uh, take only the smaller frequency part. So this is like half above this. So this function is like an average of something that's thicker than theta. So this is making this averages that's and, and uh, when the dimension here, when the, when the set E is has dimension smaller than one, so we can think of those the points in E are they are relatively sparse. And, and we are doing this average. So one can think that because things are sparser, so average usually does not uh, cannot be bigger than the original thing. That, that's like very rough uh, explanation of why the low frequency path doesn't uh, dominate. But uh, if you are interested, you can do the calculation by yourself. And it's, not, it's not complicated. So we'll, we'll focus on the high frequency path. And usually in, in this uh, type of method, usually the low frequency path does not cause a problem. And the, the high frequency path is something that we need to use many tools. And sometimes it doesn't work. So after the explanation I had, this is dominated by a constant times the high frequency And so how, how to estimate the high frequency part here? You can see that the, the slabs in the same collection because they are they are normal, they are parallel. So when we take the free transform, it was supported, those parallel slabs were supported on the same data because the data tilde, because it's like the, the tube through the origin and pointing in the actual data. So we can uh, define that data sum over by t as t is in the same uh, and then, so if we define a theta and high frequency path this way, we can see that the free transform of this function is supported on the outside of a theta tilde. So we, are, we take off the middle part, that's low frequency. And outside, because there are two pointing in different directions, their the, the overlapping is very small. So, so this is less than the volume of E to the one half. And, uh, this is by Kishi Schwartz. And then by Pontreal, we can take the free transform. <coughs> and since the, the support of the free transform of those functions, they are like disjoint because they are outside. And so we have so disjoint. Less than sum over theta. So that's the definition. And so this is the key step. And that in, in, in this method. And later we are going to see how we improve this step when certain things happen. Um, and, and then we take the free transform. 
So now we, because this is a frequency truncation, we can uh, just remove the high frequency part. And since each F, so this step is the only step where we need to discuss that it's high frequency. And the last step, because then we, we take partial and then this free transform is removed. And F theta is a sum over those parallel disjoint slabs. So this is. And each phi t is like a characteristic function. Taking square doesn't change its value not too much. So in the end, we get something like <clears throat> and you can so. This you can say that it gives an alternate truth of Maxwell's production. Um, so so far we didn't use anything uh, about our set lambda and E yet. So this is a pretty general theorem uh, that like um, and and then and the, the key step is this step. And uh, one can, one might ask, can we do something better? So let me write out what this step says. It says that, so um, we have, let's say G is FH, and it says that it's a term of this type. So this is a theorem of this type, it's, you can also give it a name called L2 decoupling. That's the decoupling inequality that we are going to discuss. I think we ended up on the wrong page. Is, is lambda infinite? Um, so we are thinking, so everything is that scalar yeah. delta. So we are, take, we are taking delta separate. Yeah. Okay, so there's some line that you should imagine on the board somewhere where it says, take the original lambda and replace it with the delta separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So would there be a loss of delta to the epsilon or whatever? Yeah, delta yeah, delta? it will be a loss of delta epsilon. Um, uh, very quickly, I'm going to say that um, since uh, the, those, those tubes, they are pointing in direction of theta, and in the projection that we care about, the theta is a non, uh, the, the set of theta that is on a non degenerate curve. So we should think that our <coughs> The support is supported on some curved collection of the outside of the tubes. And, and that's, that, that, that's where the curvature comes in. Like, so now we're talking about uh, lemma has curvature. Lambda has curvature. So, there, so in general, if M, equals to this in Rn is a, uh, like a manifold. And so this manifold are really simple. It can be like a cone or sphere or parabola. And we decompose it into a different, a different uh, into a disjoint union of tiles. For example, in this picture, the tiles are the, like those outside of the tube. Uh, the decoupling asks uh, if we have a function uh, G with real transform, uh, G tau with real transform supported on the time. 
and that G equals the sum over G. The decoupling party asked for what P and Q such that now P number Q is bounded by there might be some loss. We, we call this um, decoupling constant and times the sum over G tau. Uh, so usually uh, we can usually the Q will be uh, P or two. Um, and and we, we care about when this uh, loss is like very small. So already here you can see something that looks very similar to that. It's just we replace the two by Q, this two by Q, and this two, sorry, this two by P and this two by Q. And it explores the cancellation because of curvature. And so usually if we use this inequality instead of that, when the curvature happens, it gives us some improvement. And that, that's the main idea behind our proof of the theorem. The, the kind of question one asks is, let's say Q equals to two, for what range of P such that the coupling constant is bounded by, uh, so up to some uh, absolute power is bounded by a constant. Um, one thing is when M is flat. Uh, for example, in our enemy example for projections. So when this corresponds to our lambda is on this great circle, then P equals to two is the best possible. And so this uh, decoupling inequality, uh, those questions was asked by uh, Tom Wolf. And then there was uh, the like, breakthrough by uh, Buchten and Demeter. Well, they put for M to be a paraboloid and a cop. And later there is a work of uh, and diameter book. Well, they put for M equals to uh, this uh, moment curve. Already, I think I suppose you can see the connection between the happening for this curve and the restricted projection that we study, that, that we care about at the beginning. So this is uh, the decoupling inequality that we used in, in the proof. That, and, and you, but there is one thing that here is like a union of those tubes. And so there's one step. Uh, Reduce that reduces the decoupling inequality for those curve to a decoupling inequality for cone over a curve. And this step is standard. It's with, uh, it's called a Pramanic and Ziegler uh, argument. Uh, so, you, so once we get a decoupling inequality, then we can plug in that. And so some people, uh, maybe you care about covering the set, not by slab, but by uh, things. Uh, this shape, a uh, plank, and this is also uh, in in some middle step of the cap. I don't think I have time to discuss more, but that's the that's the main idea. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yeah. So the sort of non-degeneracy condition that you've imposed on this curve is about the the determinants. Determinants. Is there any um, the determinant of the, the derivatives to the matrix that you get? Uh, is there any feeling for whether that condition is uh, necessary for such a theorem? 
uh, yes. So if that condition does not hold, that means um, the, the, the curve is flat in some way, mm -hmm. and then you can cook up some example. So it's necessary and sufficient to have a more strength like theorem for projections like the one you had here on the board. If you are considering like smooth curves, yes, it's mm -hmm. necessary and sufficient. But if you consider other shapes, say not yeah. curves, but some fractal sometimes, then I don't know. Then, yeah. <laughs> have you considered the case of higher K? Uh, yes, we proved for higher K, and for higher K, it's more complicated. So, uh, yeah, the result, uh, I erase it. The result is for all. Would the decoupling work in the same way? It's it's more central. So, the, that, in that case, those, the free transform is not supported on the tubes, but they support it on some higher dimensional shapes, and they have a lot of overlap. And we need, we need to decompose those overlap. Uh, this region according to how much they overlap. And then we don't have really have control of the shapes that come out. And we have to study what the decoupling inequality for the shapes that come out. We have to put them together. It's more subtle. And it took us a while to figure it out. Do you get any information on the set of bad uh, theta? And, and also, you know, do you have a Correct how sort of mention for almost all, but apart from the fact that it has measure zero, can we say anything about the exceptional set? Yeah, yeah. So if you look at this uh, thing, it, but here I said that we proved the master of inequality, but in reality, we proved uh, uh, some kind of uh, exceptional set estimate, like Falconer's uh, exceptional set. So for example, in R2, if we map from R2 to R, it says that um, it recovers Barclay's theorem. I don't know. Do, do you know? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it would take too long to explain it. <laughs> no, it's, so you just plug in, so here, you, you have your, say, let's say the bad set has a certain dimension, and this, and the, this T will correspond to the, um, the, the projection image has dimension delta minus f, and then you multiply by the, the dimension of the exceptional set, say, say delta to minus alpha, and then this is also the dimension of the so you, you plug in and then you figure it out. So, so what does the broad statement say? That, that uh, does it give you a bound on the house alternation in the acceptance set? Or yes. Basically, and, it, and it's some number that comes out of the other numbers. Yeah, it's some numbers that come out of this. I see. And that's sort of the most you can have to say. There's no nice structure. Uh, the structure of the acceptance set. Right. Uh, no, I don't know. And also, so in, for example, in R from when you do the projection from R2 to R, there are two types of exceptional set estimate. One is the Falconer's type. And so that's when the set has large dimension, the E has large dimension. And the other uh, type is called Kaufman's projection theorem. And our methods, I don't think it says anything about Kaufman's projection theorem. Uh, yeah, so is an intermediate result here some sort of Semmerini Trotter type inequality for this incident set? So you've lined up to give a nice uh, inequality here, uh, an upper bound on this IET, uh, the measure of this uh, set of incidences. Yeah. It looks a lot like Semmerini Trotter, except you've got kind of this delta thickened everywhere. Um, so <coughs> I think it. So indeed, we use this method to prove a semi charter like theorem in R2, where we impose some spacing condition between the tubes. Okay. But um, just this method, I don't think you will get exactly the same estimation, but because it's too strong. Mm -hmm. and there, there will be some common sense to it. So in, in two dimensions, though, for a collection of 
delta bolts and I guess delta tubes or something yeah. like this. You have a summary HR type statement that comes out. Yes, but only show. if the, the tubes are well spaced. Right. Okay. Interesting. Thanks. No more questions? Thank you again.